Hello and welcome to the 2018 ABR Non-Interpretive Skills Study Guide Review. This is David Larson, Vice Chair of Education and Clinical Operations in the Department of Radiology at Stanford University, and I'm here to review the material covered in the 2018 Non-Interpretive Skills Study Guide. A little background before we get started. First, the purpose of these videos is to help individuals learn the material covered in the American Board of Radiology's 2018 Non-Interpretive Skills Study Guide that is published online and freely available for everyone to see. The target audience of these videos is radiologists in training, especially obviously those who are preparing to take the ABR core and certifying examinations. A few important disclaimers. Again, these videos are meant to help viewers better understand the Non-Interpretive Skills Study Guide. So they're not specifically test prep videos per se, except to the extent that better understanding the study guide will help you prepare to take the exam, which presumably it will. Uh, specifically, while I will be posing many questions to the viewers, there are no so-called boards-like test questions contained in these videos. Rather, questions are open-ended uh, to help encourage the viewer to think more deeply about the topic, so there won't be multiple choice types of questions. In fact, I will warn you that some of the questions are so-called what am I thinking types of questions. So if you don't have, have a specific answer, that's okay. I'm more just trying to elicit you know, what's there in the study guide to help you think about it. Uh, all the content is referenced in the study guide with the pages clearly marked. Also, I provide several mnemonics. Honestly, these are probably unnecessary. Um, I don't personally use them, but some viewers have asked me for them. So if you find mnemonics helpful to help you remember things, uh, I provided some mnemonics. I'm not sure that you necessarily need to know them. Uh, I apologize in advance for any errors in the content. Hopefully any such errors are minor. However, I will say that I'm not paid to do this in any way. So if something slipped to the editor, which is me, uh, please go on, go easy on him. I will say that uh, it's, it's to warn you, it's low production value, uh, but I will guarantee you that it's uh, at least worth what you paid for it. And if you don't like it, I will return all the money back to you that you have given to me. And the final uh, point, and this is very important, these videos are presented with the permission of the ABR, that, but they are not uh, ABR approved official content. So any claims or opinions made in here are mine or mine alone. If there are any issues with it, uh, please come to me. It's not uh, the ABR who's producing this. And so with that, why don't we start with a brief introduction to these videos. Um, we'll just go through question by question. So each question will have an open-ended question that we'll pose to you. Then there will be a timer and uh, it'll give it'll count down give you a few seconds if you want to take the case with others or just yourself if you want to have a minute to think about it you can pause the video if you want um, but that that timer is there then i will pose the answer we review the details and then we'll just go on to the next question so we'll move pretty fast um, just a note uh we will go about 20 to 25 minutes per video uh then just wherever pretty much we are if, even if we're not at a great stopping point we'll just stop and uh wrap it up and move to another video and wherever we are in the study guide and then we're going to go through the entire study guide uh, so feel free to watch this at double or triple speed sometimes i speak kind of slowly um, so you're welcome to go as fast as you want Okay, so now let's talk about the material in the Non-Interpretive Skills Study Guide. Uh, and so uh, let's start with a question that you may have for me, and that is, why on earth do I need to know all this extraneous, uh, shall we say, stuff? Um, you know, there's, there are questions here about quality improvement, about teamwork, uh, professionalism, uh, you know, things that seem relatively extraneous to the day-to-day -day work that we do in radiology. Uh, and I think it's a fair question, a uh, fair question for me. Uh, I would say that, uh, you know, we understand, of course, why we need to understand uh, MRI safety or contrast safety. So that's pretty straightforward. But what about these other things? I would say, uh, for one thing, organizations are getting larger and more complex. Uh, and so we have to be able to operate in this complex environment. And it's not as straightforward as we might think. So if we're going to provide good care, we need to be able to work in and run large organizations, especially as organizations are continuing to enlarge in, in healthcare in general, but specifically in radiology. Uh, someday, chances are you will be a leader in your organization, in your practice, or in your healthcare organization. And when that happens, you will try to make things better. Um, and if you aren't uh, prepared ahead of time, you'll be tempted, uh, you'll be tempted to just wing it, uh, to just kind of go with your instincts. And what you're going to find in a complex organization is it's not going to work and you're going to be frustrated and then you're going to wonder why. Um, but hopefully then you will look back to the material that you've received. Um, and then you will gratefully realize that it provided you with some of the basic tools to help you 
in your practice to help your practice work more effectively. Um, hopefully you can use some of those tools and uh, apply them uh, for the benefit of your practice and your patients. When you do that, please mail me a check for $1 million, uh, US dollars, please. Um, or otherwise, if you just want to provide a thank you, that will work as well. So that's the, uh, my answer to your question you posed to me. Let's now dive in and start with a warm up. And we're going to talk about the introduction of the study guide. So this is content that's actually in the introduction. You'll see this is on page Roman numeral two. Uh, so the first question is, what determines whether materials should be included in the non-interpretive skills section of the ABR exam? We'll give you just a minute to think about that. Okay, so uh, this is what it says in the study guide. Uh, so first of all, well, well, there are two things. First of all, knowledge needed to perform effectively in a modern radiology practice and the public should be served by the examining knowing material. In other words, is this something that, if you, that you really need to know to be able to perform effectively in modern radiology? Um, and if so, you know, it's, and it's unrelated to all the clinical content, then it's in the non-interpretive skills. And if it's not, if you don't really need to know it, then the authors have really tried to pare it down. Um, and then also that the public benefits from you knowing this material. Um, so you're going to see a lot of uh, professionalism and other things that, you know, you just need to know at some point in your career, and this is the best time to do it. There's really not any other time in your career where someone's going to make sure you understand the basics of professionalism, for example. Uh, it, as it says in the introduction, things that are not included in the study guide, uh, subspecialty specific quality and safety knowledge and skills, especially nuclear medicine and procedure based specialties. So uh, uh, potentially, I, I imagine you might be uh, facing a question related to those uh, um, areas that are not in the study guide that would be, fair, would be fair game. So you do need to know nuclear medicine safety and other procedure based specialty types of safety questions. Uh, also physics, including radiation and safety, that is not in the non-interpretive skills section. And then uh, research methodology, Bayesian statistics, these, uh, as it says in the, in the study guide, are no longer in the examination at all, so there's not really anything you need to worry about. It's been removed from the study guide and um, will no longer appear on the examination is what we're told, at least for the foreseeable future. Um, in general, the guidelines that are provided, uh, you should know general non-interpretive skills concepts and their application. Um, it's not expected that you would know more superficial details, such as what was the example that was given, is the name of various regulatory agencies. Not so much that, more like the, the application. Um, although a uh, caveat is you really need to know the details of like MRI and contrast safety. I mean, that's, you, you, there are some details there you, you do need to know. But otherwise, hopefully, some kind of these superficial details, it's less about that. It's more about to understand the underlying concepts. Okay, there we go. So with that, we're going to dive right into section 1.1 the ABIM Physician Charter for Medical Professionalism in the New Millennium. So first question in this section, what is professionalism? I think the first question to answer here is, what is a profession? Uh, and a profession can be defined as a calling requiring specialized knowledge and often long and intensive academic preparation. So the profession is different than many other types of uh, employment situations. Um, and so then professionalism represents the conduct, aims, or qualities that characterize or mark a profession or a professional person. Um, so it's basically, we have as, as professionals a contract, so to speak, a contract with society um, where uh, we will uh, perform to the best of our ability and we self-regulate. We're guided by ethical principles. And for that, we are allowed to do things that uh, others are generally not, to, not allowed to do. We're allowed access to... Uh, sensitive information to uh, patients' bodies, to uh, um, interventions that others don't, but there's, along with that, the uh, expectation that we will adhere to certain principles, and that, in a nutshell, is professionalism. So there are three fundamental principles of professionalism. Uh, that is the principle of the primacy of patient welfare, the principle of patient autonomy, and the principle of social justice. So that leads us to our next question, and uh, that is, describe the principles of primacy of patient welfare, patient autonomy, and social justice. 
So first of all, the primacy of patient welfare. Um, that's uh, hopefully pretty obvious. That is that physicians must be dedicated to serving the interest of the patient. Uh, and the trust must not be compromised by market forces, societal pressures, or administrative exigencies. In other words, uh, we're genuinely working on behalf of the patient, not on behalf of ourselves or others. Uh, second, patient autonomy. Uh, physicians must be honest with their patients and empower them to make informed decisions about their treatment. And it must be in keeping with ethical practice and uh, not lead to demands for inappropriate care. Um, so in other words, patients... Uh, you know, they need to be informed and then they need to be able to make decisions and control their, their own destiny. Uh, social justice uh, means that the medical profession must promote the fair distribution of healthcare resources and physicians should work actively to eliminate discrimination in healthcare. Hopefully that's fairly straightforward. Okay, next question. What are the 10 professional responsibilities of medical professionalism? So those uh, responsibilities are professional competence, honesty with patients, patient confidentiality, maintaining appropriate relations with patients, improving quality of care, improving access to care, just distribution of finite resources, scientific knowledge, managing conflicts of interest, and professional res responsibilities. Now, I don't know if you would need to be able to rattle off a list uh, like this, but if but you do need to be familiar with each of these concepts. So if you want to have something to memorize, uh, here's a silly mnemonic chop card quack. Again, quite silly. Uh, so if it helps you, great. If not, then feel free to completely ignore it. But you should know uh, each of the concepts and what they represent. So let's dive in and talk about the first one. And so in this one, uh, take a minute and think about what would be an example that would illustrate commitment to professional competence. Okay, professional competence means uh, lifelong learning of or per commitment to professional confidence mean that you're committed to lifelong learning of medical knowledge and team skills and that the profession strives to uh, see that its members are competent and that you have mechanisms in place to ensure that this happens. So commitment to professional competence would be maybe you have ongoing uh, activities that you make sure that you are competent, that others are reviewing your performance and you're reviewing others when you receive feedback, that you accept it because uh, if, if you need to improve, that's part of your professional commitment to maintaining your competence. Um, so that's the type of, of uh, illustration, the type of example you would, you would expect to see um, that would be related to commitment to professional competence. So we'll move, through, we'll move through these a little bit faster now. So provide an example that illustrates commitment to honesty with patients. So this is fairly uh, self-explanatory, uh, but honesty with pa the commitment to honesty with patients uh, basically means physicians, physicians must be completely honest, and they must inform patients before obtaining consent. So they've got to basically be very open. Uh, medical errors should be promptly communicated to patients. This is not something we enjoy doing, but it's our, our professional commitment to do so. And physicians should report and analyze their own mistakes to prevent and improve in the future. So you can imagine a uh, type of example might be something where you disclose an error to a patient and let them know what happened and what you're planning to do. And again, keep them in the conversation and talk about their care as they're going forward, even though a mistake was made. Next question, provide an example that illustrates commitment to patient confidentiality. So this commitment refers to, pretty self-explanatory, safeguarding patient information in whatever format that you receive it, whether it's verbal or you maintain it electronically, um, that we safeguard all of that information. And we have safeguards in place to, to, pr to uh, preserve that safety. Um, uh, there are times where public interest may override this, such as when patients may endanger others uh, or themselves, and that is usually specified fairly clearly, and it's usually state by state. Uh, but uh, for the vast majority of the time, we need to maintain patient confidentiality. So a good example might be, what are you using to uh, safeguard uh, electronic information that you take out of the hospital, for example, that you need to work from home? Okay, next question. Uh, provide an example that illustrates commitment to maintaining appropriate relations with patients. 
So as professionals, we are expected to avoid relationships that may exploit inherent vulnerability and dependency of patients. And so specifically, uh, we must never exploit patients for sexual advantage, personal financial gain, or other private purpose. So uh, you, one example of this might be you know, dating a patient or having inappropriate relations with a patient or having some expectation of uh, financial gain because uh, you're their doctor and you kind of expect maybe that they'll provide something in return or maybe some implication that they will. That's just not okay. And again, we, we share this. Hopefully this will never be an issue. Unfortunately, it happens rarely. So um, now that you're aware of this, this is, a, this is one of those good ways to get yourself uh, to lose your license, basically, to, to violate this one. Okay, next, provide an example that illustrates commitment to improving quality of care. Okay, so this is, again, fairly explanatory, self-explanatory. Uh, this is the expectation that we as professionals will work collaboratively to continuously improve quality, and that includes reducing medical errors, increasing patient safety, uh, decreasing utilization of, re of inappropriate utilization of resources, and optimizing health outcomes. Um, so an illustration of this would be, um, you know, a quality improvement, dedicated quality improvement activity that you go above and beyond and work to improve something when you come across something that uh, clearly needs to be improved. Next question, provide an example that illustrates commitment to improving access to care. So access to care refers to uh, removing barriers to care. Uh, barriers sometimes are based on things like education, uh, laws, uh, finances, uh, geography, social discrimination. So all those things that make it difficult for patients or, or even impossible for patients to get care. Uh, so there is the expectation that we will help remove those barriers that we as professionals promote public health, and that uh, at the same time, though, as we remove barriers, this is not to be used for self-interest. So we should not be doing it just so that we can steer more patients to us and make more money, uh, either to ourselves or to our profession. So that's not okay either. Uh, we do need to remove those barriers, but it's really for the patient uh, patient's benefit. Next question, provide an example that illustrates commitment to just distribution of finite resources. All right, so this commitment refers to uh, working with others to develop evidence-based guidelines for effective use of resources. In other words, it, it means we have only so much that we have to work with, and we need to make sure that it's used appropriately and that it's used for individuals who need it. So this includes things like avoiding unnecessary tests, minimizing exposure to harm due to like over testing or overexposure, uh, you know, to uh, uh, especially to multiple tests that kind of lead to uh, increased um, inappropriate care. Uh, decreasing healthcare expenses overall, uh, improving access to care. So again, this is this is what is referred to as just distribution of finite resources. So you might have, uh, an illustration might be something along the lines of, um, you know, you work together to, you find that there's something that you're overdoing, like let's say you're overdoing CTPAs for uh, question pulmonary embolism, and you work together to reduce the number of inappropriate tests. Next question, provide an example that illustrates commitment to scientific knowledge. All right, so again, this refers to physicians uh, making the commitment to upholding scientific standards, uh, promoting research, um, creating new medical knowledge based on scientific evidence, and ensuring appropriate use. Now, this is not so much their personal knowledge. This is about uh, upholding uh, scientific knowledge in general, making sure the knowledge that is in the literature is uh, evidence-based and truly uh, scientific. Um, so this might refer to um, how a, a practice, um, either in a research environment, maintains um, uh, the highest uh, scientific standards, or how they, when they apply it clinically, that they make sure that they really do a thorough evidence evalu evaluation of the evidence in order to make sure what they're applying is evidence-based. Next question, provide an example that illustrates commitment to maintaining trust by managing conflicts of interest. Okay, so conflicts of interest is what, what we're talking about here. Um, uh, of course, first of all, the first step is to recognize, disclose, and deal with any conflicts of interest. A conflict is de uh, dis defined as a relationship that may provide private gain or personal advantage. And this is especially important with for-profit companies that are involved somehow. 
um, and is especially important when you're conducting and reporting clinical trials, when you're writing editorials or guidelines or editing scientific journals, because these have uh, the p potential to influence others uh, and, and influence the whole field. So especially in these situations, it's really important to maintain and manage, uh, maintain trust by managing conflicts of interest. So an example might be uh, an illustration that you uh, are you have a conflict um, and now you're reporting it for example or you're, or you're doing a related publication the question is then what should you do of course you should report it um, you should make sure that you're to the extent possible unbiased you can't do anything that would profit you uh, intentionally and you need to let people know that you do have this conflict so a conflict by itself doesn't necessarily mean you're doing the wrong thing of course in fact you expect it, you're expected to not do the wrong thing um, but you are expected to disclose the conflict so that people can you know use that little extra bit of scrutiny when they evaluate what you're saying next question provide an example that illustrates commitment to professional responsibilities Okay, so professional responsibilities includes things like working collaboratively uh, to optimize patient care. So in other words, can you work well with other professionals? That's one of the commitments that we have. We, we, have, to, we have to actually, believe it or not, uh, be uh, collaborative and work well with each other. Uh, can we be respectful of one another? Um, we are expected to participate in the process of self-regulation, and that includes remediation and discipline of those who do not meet uh, our high standards. Uh, which is a difficult one. Uh, we then also need to define and organize educational and standard setting processes. Uh, and then we have to then on the other end of it, have to accept uh, internal assessment and external scrutiny. So we just have to understand people are going to be watching our performance. And if there's feedback and if there's something we need to improve, then the answer is yes, we will work uh, to improve. We won't get defensive when that happens. So that's a, a type of illustration you might see. Another one might be, uh, what do you do when you have a colleague who uh, you know is not meeting the professional standards? And the reality is, as a professional, it is our obligation to uh, go through the process that has been set up to uh, make sure that we remediate that. Okay, this is actually a good stopping point, I think. So why don't we do, go ahead and stop there, and uh, next we'll move to the next section. So again, thank you for watching. My name is David Larson, and we are reviewing the 2018 Non-Interpretive Skills Study Guide.